chapter 7, page 214, The New Front. In September, Kharkov was taken by the Soviets. The entire South and Central Front was seriously shaken, with several major breaks through which the enemy poured their tanks, jeopardizing our whole system of defense. A general withdrawal began, during which the Russians often managed to surround entire divisions. Our unit had been re re-equipped with new weapons and rapid motor vehicles, and, and we used to check to the enemy penetration behind our lines, often achieving prodigies which were cited in the orders of the day. Wherever the gross Deutschland appeared, our troops took heart and routed the enemy, or so it seemed. Of course, the general difficulties of our situation, our encirclement, and the despair of the troops forced to abandon their weapons in a sea of mud were never mentioned. Nor were such things as the adjutant and his section taken prisoner, and liberated too late, or the profound sense of hopelessness and misery which settled over the adult children we were, facing another winter of war, more human bridges across icy rivers like the one over the Dnieper, more frozen, abandoned regiments and scorched earth and weeks of terror, like our week at Chernigov, more hands cracked open by chillblains and more fatal acceptance of the idea of death. Generals have since written accounts of these events, locating particular catastrophes and summarizing in a sentence or a few lines the losses from sickness or freezing. But they never, to my knowledge, gave sufficient expression to the wretchedness of soldiers abandoned to a fate one would wish to spare even to the most miserable cur. They never evoked the hours upon hours of agony or the obvious resentment of individuals swamped by the herd in which each man is lost in his own misery and oblivious to the sufferings of others. They never mention the common soldiers, sometimes covered with glory, sometimes beaten and defeated, burdened by the angry remonstrances of the non-cons and by the hatred of another herd of human beings whom it is officially permissible to hate, confounded by murder and degradation and later by disillusionment when he realizes that victory will not return him to his liberty. In the end, there was only the physical crime of war and the hypocritical and intellectual crime of peace. That's why you're fighting, Captain Hauptmann Weissreidau, our captain said to us one day. You're nothing more than animals on the defensive, even when you're obligated to take the offensive. So be brave. Life is war, and war is life. Liberty doesn't exist. Captain Weissreidau often helped us to endure the worst. He was always on good terms with his men, and was never one of those soldiers who are so impressed by their own rank that they treat ordinary suit soldiers like valueless pawns to be used without scruple. He stood beside us during countless gray watches and came into our bunkers to talk with us and make us forget the howling storm outside. I can still see his thin face, faintly lit by a wavering lamp leaning over beside one of ours. Germany is a great country, he used to tell us. Today our difficulties are immense. The system in which we more or less believe is every bit as good as the slogans on the other side. Even if we don't always approve of what we have to do, we must carry out orders for the sake of our country, our comrades, and our families, against whom the other half of the world is fighting in the name of truth and justice. All of you are old enough to understand that. I've done a great deal of traveling to South America, even to New Zealand, some Spain, since Spain, I have fought in Poland and France and now Russia, and I can tell you that everywhere there are the same dominating hypocrisies. Life, my father, the example of former times, all of these taught me to sustain my existence with rectitude and loyalty. And I have clung to these principles in spite of all the hardships and follies, which must have been my lot. Many times when I could have responded with a thrust of the sword, I only smiled and blamed myself, assuming that I myself was the cause of all my troubles. When I had my first taste of war in Spain, I thought of suicide, 
It all seemed so vile, but then I saw the ferocity of others who also believed in the justice of their cause and offered themselves up to acts of murder as to some sort of purification. I watched the soft, effeminate French ship from terror to toughness take up the arms they couldn't use when they need them once we had restored their confidence and offered them the hands of friendship. In general, human beings don't accept the unaccustomed. Change frightens and upsets them, and they will fight even to preserve situations they've already detested. But a slick armchair philosopher can easily arouse a rabble to support an abstract proposition. For instance, all men are equal. Even when the differences between men are obviously as great as the differences between cows and roosters. Then those exhausted societies drained by their quote-unquote liberty begin to bellow out their quote-unquote convictions and become a threat to us and to peace. It's basic wisdom to keep people like that well-fed and content if one wishes to extract even a tenth of the possible return. Something of this kind is happening on the other side. As a people, we are fortunate in being somewhat less indolent than they. If someone tells us to examine ourselves, we at least have the courage to do it. Our condition is not absolutely perfect, but at least we agree to look at the other things and take chances. We are now embarked on a risky enterprise with no assurance of safety. We are advancing an idea of unity which is neither rich nor easily digestible. But the vast majority of the German people accept it and adhere to it, forging and forming it in an admirable collective effort. This is where we are now risking everything. We are trying, taking due account of the attitudes of society, to change the face of the world, hoping to revive the ancient virtues buried under the layers of filth bequeathed to us by our forebears. We can expect no reward for this effort. We are loathed everywhere. If we should lose tomorrow, those of us still alive after so much suffering will be judged without justice. We shall be accused of an infinity of murder, as if everywhere and everything and at all times men at war do not behave in the same way. Those who have an interest in putting an end to our ideals will ridicule everything we believe in. We shall be spared nothing, even if the tombs of our heaps our heroes will be destroyed, only preserving, as a just respect for the dead, a few which contain figures of doubtful heroism, who were never really fully committed to our cause. With our deaths, all the prodigies of heroism, which our daily circumstances require of us, and the memories of our comrades dead and alive, and in the communion of spirits, of fears and hopes, will vanish, and our history will never be told. Future generations will speak only of an idiotic, unqualified sacrifice. Whether you wanted it or not, you are now part of this undertaking, and nothing which follows can equal the efforts you have made. If you must sleep tomorrow under the quieter skies of the opposite camp, in that case, you will never be forgiven for having survived. You will either be rejected or preserved like a rare animal which has escaped a cataclysm. With other men, you will be as cats are to dogs, and you will never have any real friends. Do you wish such an end for yourself? Anyone who wishes to go but is hesitating for fear of authority should speak to me. I will take as many nights as it needs to reassure you. I repeat, those who wish to leave should do so. We cannot count on men who feel that way, and our efforts cannot gain from their presence. Please believe that I understand your sufferings. I feel the cold and fear as you do, and I fire at the enemy as you do, because I feel that my duty is an offer of fires of meat, at least as much from me as your duty does of you. I wish to stay alive, even if it's only continue the struggle somewhere else. I wish my company to be united in thought and in deed. Once the fighting begins, I will not tolerate doubt and defeatism. We shall be suffering not only in the interest of ultimate victory, but in the interest of daily victory against those who hurl themselves at us without respite, and whose only thought is to exterminate us without any understanding of what is at stake. You can feel certain of me in return and certain that I will not expose you to any unnecessary dangers. I would burn and destroy entire villages if by doing so I could prevent even one of us from dying of hunger.
Here, deep in the wilds of the steppe, we shall be all the more aware of our unity. We are surrounded by hatred and death, and in these circumstances we shall daily oppose our perfect cohesion to the indiscipline and order of our enemies. Our group must be as one, and our thoughts must be identical. Your duty lies in your efforts to achieve that goal, and if we do achieve it and maintain it, we shall be victors even in death. Our conversations with Captain Weissreidau made a deep impression on us. His obvious and passionate sincerity affected even the most hesitant and seemed of another order that the standard appears to our sense of sacrifice, which left us stupefied and incredulous. He invited questions, which he answered with intelligence and clarity. He spent his time with us whenever he was free from other duties. We all loved him and felt we had a true leader, as well as a friend on whom we could count. Herr Haltzman of Weissreidau was a terror to the enemy and a father to his men. Every time we moved or were sent out on operation, his Steiner and his self preceded our vehicles. The veteran, who had a good sense of men, had pointed him out to us the day after the battle for Belgrad, who were resting in the rear, nursing our wounds. I've seen our captain. He looks intelligent and wise. We fought two more battles before recrossing to the Dnieper in the beginning of the autumn. Several of us had to be re-equipped for these engagements, and the most serious accusations were leveled against anyone who returned without his weapons. Lindbergh, the Sudeten, and Hals, however, were officially recognized as wounded when they came back the evening of the rout in rags without weapons or equipment. It can easily be managed, imagined that equipment has to be abandoned when one is on the run, but in Russia our soldiers were never supposed to abandon their arms. They were supposed to die with them or live hanging on to them at all costs. I myself had kept my gun without thinking of the consequences. Like a blind man who never lets go of a white cane, and the veteran had dragged along his heavy spandau machine gun out of has habit or discipline. But I had lost my helmet, my ground sheet, the gas mask we never used, and what remained of the ammunition for the veteran's spandau machine gun. We met Lenson, who had come out alive too, although he had left behind most of his gear. He was tearing his hair at the thought that this oversight might cost him his rank. The veteran, who is also an Oberkefreiter, suggested that next time Lenson think of putting in for posthumous promotion, Lenson's anxiety and our laughter were simultaneously drowned a short later on the uh, alcoholic drink Samohonka someone found in the cellar of an abandoned house. It was almost surely because of Captain Feist right out that we all escaped to course monitor, which filled us with just as much terror as Soviet rockets. We had three good weeks of rest behind our lines in a village of dreary, identical shacks. Luckily, the weather was magnificent. I took advantage of the lull to write orders to Paula, but I could never bring myself to tell her of my terror at Belgorod. Hals had made the acquaintance of a Russian girl with whom he is able to uh, arrange a mutually profitable relationship. It turned out he was not the only one to enjoy the good women's favors. One evening he arrived to find himself part of a troika. The other masculine member was the Catholic chaplain, who had survived hell and was indulging a few sins of the flesh as his consciousness of life returned hoping they would be parted because they were so rare. From that moment on, he was never able to intone a psalm without an accompanying chorus of laughter, at which we would blush furiously and laugh as loud as the rest of us. All went well until one morning toward the end of September, and the distant rumble of guns reminded us that we had not come to Russia to play. In fact, the Russians had just broken through the front our troops had managed to re-establish west of Belgrade, and our grand debacle was beginning. Our generals, who believed that our troops could, if not attack, at least 
hold the reconstituted front, noticed somewhat belatedly that our regiments were being decimated simply to slow down the irresistible momentum of those strong Russian forces which were attacking all along the central sector. What we should have done before even thinking of turning back to the east now seems like a simple act of realism which should have been recognized while it was still possible. At the time, however, the order to withdraw to the west bank of the Dnieper was given very late. The line of the Dnieper meant Kiev on the central axis, Cherkasy on the south, and Chernikov to the north on the Desna River, a distance of 100 miles. We were continuously pursued by an enemy who was fast becoming far more mobile than we were and threatening to overtake us at any moment, filling our ranks with panic and confusion. What might have been possible before Belgrade was no longer so, except that an inordinary, inordinate price of blood and sweat with the incessant rearguard fighting. The Fermacht, adhering strictly to orders, sacrificed many more men on this belated retreat than they had during their advance. We died by the thousands that honor on the Ukrainian plain, and our battles, unheralded by any fanfare, consumed many heroes. The frontline troops, in constant contact with an ever more pressing enemy, had already made up their minds about the future. Even the most hermetically sealed of our men understood that no matter how many Russians uh, were killed, or how many hundreds of Russians he killed, or how bravely he fought, the next day hundreds more would appear, and so on for the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. And even the blindest saw that the Russian soldiers were moved by a blind heroism and boldness, so that even a mountain of dead compatriots would not stop them. We knew that under such circumstances, combat often favors simple numerical superiority, and much of the time we felt desperate. Can anyone blame us? We knew that we almost surely would be killed by time for a large-scale redeployment of troops. We knew that our sacrifice was in a good cause, and if our courage incited us to hours of resignation, the hours and days which followed would find us with dry eyes, which were filled with immense sadness. Then we would fire in a lunatic frenzy without mercy. We didn't wish to die and would kill and massacre as if to avenge ourselves in advance for what we knew what was going to happen to us. When we died, it was with fury because we had not been able to extract enough retribution. And if we survived, it was as if madmen, never able to readapt to the peacetime world. Sometimes we would try to run away, but orders adroitly worded in space soothed us like shots of morphine. On the Dnieper, we were told, everything will be easier. Ivan won't be able to force the barrage, so courage and do your best to hold him off. If you want everyone to get through, the Russian counteroffensive will be crushed on the Dnieper, and then we'll resume our push to the east. Through our panic and despair, the order became a duty. Our adversaries were astonished by the courage of the ordinary German officers. A hundred yards at a time, we withdrew to the Dnieper in safety, slowing down the enemy as much as we could, watching our comrades fall all around us, our desperate delaying efforts sometimes continued for days at a time across hundreds of miles. When men who had escaped from rear guard units finally reached the river, we were faced with a vast human swarm. Entire armies were waiting beside the few bridges which our engineers had managed to restore, tramping up and down the Sanfi bank, climbing onto anything that could float. The Russians were right on our heels, pressing against our perimeter of defense, which shrank alarmingly. The Luftwaffe was always somewhere overhead and partly saved the situation, but our planes were soon outnumbered by Russian MiGs and Russian Yabos. Some of our planes which escaped the long-range anti-aircraft fire had to face a constantly growing swarm of Russian fighters. The men who had not crossed the river were pressed into counterattacks at odds of a hundred to one. We performed deeds of astonishing heroism, which demonstrated once again the extraordinary resourcefulness of our soldiers. 
The weather was still good. We fought many successful battles. However, these are victories which can never be celebrated. An army fighting for its life cannot speak of victory. Nonetheless, they were victories, which cost us far, far more than those uh, we had fought as conquerors. This time, on the banks of the river, we were fighting not simply to take this or that town or district, but to avoid catastrophe. Everyone felt it and knew it. We had hours and even days of calm, but our anguish and anxiety always increased to a point of unbearable pleasure. We would throw ourselves back into battle to try to drive off the red monster about to devour us. This time we managed to avert a total catastrophe. Army Group Center passed through and the regiments still fighting were ordered to disengage. During the night we destroyed almost everything, leaving only men in light arms to be transported on the ferries which had been provided to embark the last of our troops to the west. At dawn, our exhausted men arrived at the river. It was heavily shrouded in autumn fog. Expecting friendly faces, they called out, only to be answered by Ivan's machine guns. In many places, the Russians had arrived ahead of us, sunk the boats, killed the ferrymen. Our men threw themselves into the river and tried to swim, abandoning everything. The Russians, of course, opened fire, shooting the heads, bobbing the water, as if they are clay pigeons at a fair. Perhaps a few Germans managed to reach the western bank. Elsewhere, our men crowded onto the precarious ferries which were fired at from both the shore and the sky. Others were surrounded and fought to the last. Most of these men were killed as the Russians were in no mood to take prisoners. None. Thus, we established a new front, hoping to find safety on the western bank of the Dnieper. We dug ourselves in, preparing for a long stay. This time, Ivan would not break through. It had begun to snow, and we set about arranging our bunkers, calming ourselves, reorganizing, and waiting. But news was spreading with the rapidity of the flash which follows a Russian rocket. The staff officers had done everything they could to keep the true nature of the situation from the troops. But reality was too strong and too important and broke down all the barriers of discretion, smashing the fragile hopes of the soldiers and sweeping them in a way of a tumultuous flood. The Red Army was moving toward us from Cherkasy in the east and the Dnieper in the west. To the north, they crossed the Desna and a large number of our troops were trapped at the confluence of the Desna and the Dnieper. Winter had begun, and with the falling snow and deep feeling of despair settled over us, we were exhausted and had no hope of a future respite. Where could we find it? How far would we have to withdraw? To the Pripet River? To the Boog River? The Oder! The veteran grinned sardonically. That seemed impossible, unimaginable. The Oder in Germany? One could only draw a very general view of our situation from the lines I've just written without any of the details. I'm not trying to recreate precise geographic chronologies of the Russo-German War, but to give an account of the most inconceivable difficulties we faced. I have never had more than a very approximate idea of our movements and centers of operation, and would certainly be incapable of drawing an accurate picture of the front from any point of the war. That is the province of the various disbanded steps. I, on the other hand, can describe certain moments down to the last detail. A simple smell can revive a whole tragic past for me and leave me for long stretches of time wrapped in memory and lost to the present. I know in my bones what our watchword, quote, courage, unquote, means from days and nights of resigned desperation and from the insurmountable fear which one continues to accept, even when one's brains has ceased to function normally. I know what it means remembering deliberately immobility against frozen soil whose coldness penetrates to the marrow of the bones and the howling of a stranger in the next hole. I know that one can call on all the saints in heaven for help without believing in any god. And it is this that I must describe. 
even if it means plunging back into a nightmare for nights at a time. For that is the substance of my task, to reanimate with all the intensity I can summon those distant cries from the slaughterhouse. Too many people learn about war with no inconvenience to themselves. They read about Verdun or Stalingrad without comprehension, sitting in a comfortable armchair with their feet beside the fire, preparing to go about their business the next day, as usual. One should really read such accounts under compulsion in discomfort, considering oneself fortunate not to be described in events in a letter home, writing from a hole in the mud. One should read about the war in the worst circumstances when everything is going badly, remembering that the torments of peace are trivial and not worth any white hairs. Nothing is really serious about the tranquility of peace. Only an idiot can be really disturbed by a nightmare of salary or a question of it. One should read about war standing up late at night when one is tired as I am reading about it now, at dawn while my asthma attack wears off, and even now in my sleepless exhaustion how gentle and easy peace seems. Those who read about Verdun or Stalingrad or expound theories later to friends over a cup of coffee haven't understood anything. Those who can read such accounts with a silent smile smile as they walk, feel lucky to be alive. I shall now resume my account of our life and how we began to regain our health and spirits despite the distant thunder of guns. It was too good to last, muttered the Sudeten as we watched the stream of troop carriers and other vehicles which had been flooding back for the past 24 hours. Each house in the small hamlet had become temporary headquarters for groups of officers deliberating the immediate fate of the men they were leading. The men themselves waited patiently beside their equipment, whose total mass must have been at least 10 times as great as the mass of the building. We had just been chased from our billets and were waiting under the trees at the edge of the village. Our entire company was there, grouped in order, with our equipment loaded onto civilian vehicles. A rough wind swept across the dried steppe, raising clouds of dust that veiled the empty horizon. They've thrown us out, said the veteran to a heavy drinker named Furtenbeck, but we've left them nothing but empty bottles. They waved toward the newly arrived troops who had pushed us from the east bus where we'd been taking it easy. I packed all that drink, the Samahonka, that was left under the seats of the car. Good for you, Vartenbeck. Samahonka is for an elite unit like us. The rest can get water from the troughs. I had made a new friend my own age who spoke French well. Holland Grauer had spent some time studying in France in 1941. Then the army had collared him, promised him that he would be able to continue his studies as well as provide the indispensable value of his presence in the service. Like me, he had been overwhelmed by military enthusiasm at the age of 16 and had volunteered marching in step and singing Volkensin die hard, die hard in the impeccable ranks of the Wehrmacht. Then he had experienced the good war through Poland and across a huge expanse of Russia in Belgorod and on the sack where we were sitting, contemplating the world and the war. Just like me, he had dreamed of becoming a famous aviator, piloting the JU-87s, and like me, all had retained of this dream was a vision of huge birds screaming as they swooped down from the sky. As we couldn't speak of the ordinary life we had never shared, the shattered dream we had so much desired often illuminated our misfortune. Hals had made himself scarce for the first few days. His girl, who helped him forget the war, had absorbed him almost entirely. He had just reappeared with one of his comrades in sin. His forehead was creased by an anxious frown, and he couldn't stop fretting. He unburdened himself to Grower and, and me. 
if Captain Feist right now won't let any come with us, the Reds will kill her. We can't let that happen. I understand how you feel, I said to Hals. Fortenbeck and the veteran, who were amused by her innocence, roared with laughter. If everyone in the company brought along the girl he's sleeping with, there wouldn't be enough transportation in the whole division. But there's no question of that, you bastards. Don't cry of it. You'll have plenty of time to do the same thing somewhere else. You're too thick to understand what I'm talking about. There are many jokes on the subject which Hals did not find funny. Are you in love with her, Hals? I asked, quite by chance, understanding because of Paola what being in love meant. Hals continued to bristle. Because it would certainly be possible to fall in love with a whore. Sure, why not? said Grauer, who undoubtedly was about as experienced in these matters as I was. Hals calmed down somewhat. Let's go for a walk. He said, talk, taking each of us by the shoulder. With you two, at least, it's possible to talk. When we had drawn apart, he unburdened himself. He had fallen head over heels in love and was certain he could never give love to anyone else. On that point, he was absolutely beyond any reason or argument. As for me, despite my earlier certainty I could never mention Powell to anyone, I found myself pouring out the whole story to Halsey Grauer. So that's why you had such a long face at the end of leave, said Hals. Why didn't you say anything? I would have understood, you know. We talked over our amorous difficulties for a long time, and Hals decided I was lucky. You at least are sure to see her again, he said, opening his mess tin. Through eyes misty with youthful passion, we watched the sky grow dark and the cigars come out. Our company moved out at dawn, heading west. During the day, we watched an aerial comet, which revived for our and me all our old feelings about the Luftwaffe. Our German ME 109s had the upper hand, and seven or eight Russian Yahoos fell from the sky in whirling flames, like enlarged fireworks. Toward noon, we reached an important division base. Thirty companies, including ours, were regrouped to form a large motorized armored section. For the first time, we were given overgarments of reversible cloth, white on one side and in ordinary camouflage on the other. We were also given medical checkups, which we hadn't expected, and drew a large quantity of supplies. A panzer colonel commanded our group, which was classed as autonomous. We were surprised by the quantity of new supplies for our armored section. Everywhere drivers and mechanics were giving their machine guns a final look over and revving the enormous tank engines. Mm. Tiger tanks on Porsche bodies roared as their engines began to turn over. From the sound of it, we could have been at the start of a giant motor race. We waited about two hours for the order to leave. Hals, Grauer, Several other friends and I were loaded onto a brand new truck, which had tires in front and treads on the back. We drove as far as some woods on the edge of an airfield. Everything was perfect except for the whirlwind of dust raised by our passage. The new vehicles had all been fitted with huge filters against this hazard. Some of the filters were so big it was impossible to shut the hoods of the truck, but put back all the heavy metal plating which protected the tank engines. In the welcome shade, we took off our clothes, shook them, which were gray with dust, although we had only gone a short distance. Dust had penetrated everywhere, especially our parched throats. Damn country. Even the autumn's unlivable here. Someone grumbled. A second group, as large as ours, joined us. We were now spread over several acres of brush. A short distance away, Vice Radau had just joined a cluster of officers who were conferring besides a large radio truck entirely covered with camouflage netting and all but indistinguishable from the leaves of the woods. Thin scraps of cloth in the whole range of woodlands colors fluttered and rustled in the wind like the leaves themselves. We were a powerful, well-organized unit. Our two groups together included six or seven thousand men, about a hundred tanks, an equal number of machine gun carriers, and several mobile machine shops. 
There are also three companies of light cavalry equipped with sidecars who are supposed to seek out the enemy and guide the unit to him. During this period, which was already very critical for the army, materiel was concentrated in motorized units, which in turn was supposed to support selected under-equipped infantry divisions. It is certain that the abundance of impeccable, well-conceived new material showered upon us at this time gave us a, a lift in our morale, which had been faltering seriously since Belgorod. A much-needed lift. Soldiers once more walked about with a shared air of men who felt that everything is going well. Only Hals was miserable, because he had been forced to abandon his precious Emmy to a fate which was almost certainly predictable. He was inconsolable. They should cut the balls off soldiers in wartime. That would stop fellows like Hals from making things so hard for themselves, murmured Fortenbeck. Have you ever heard of eunuchs making war? Well, our chaplain put in, geldings are just as strong as other horses. Luckily, the Padre had already proved that he was as much as compliant that way as any of us. Otherwise, we would have imagined the worst and refused to listen to him. When it was dark, our formidable armor cobs took off. As I watched, I began to understand the powerful impression our long columns of panthers must have made at the beginning of the war when they invaded the countries we still occupied. The roaring masses of tanks, their exhausts bursting into intermittent flame, gathering speed past our heavy trucks, spreading out fanwise across the large and favorable terrain. We felt curiously moved and stirred by the sight. We drove through the deepening darkness developed by a terrible uproar and din which must have been audible for a great distance. As usual, the common soldiers knew very little about their situation, and for us this movement seemed to mean that everything was going better. We felt very strong, and in fact as a group we were strong. We didn't realize that a general and laborious retreat was underway throughout the whole central sector, approximately from Smolensk to Kharkov, including whole divisions, several hundred thousand men. In our case, our rate of progress was determined by the speed of our engines. This was not generally so. Hundreds of regiments stripped off even the basic necessities and were withdrawing on foot, while fighting constantly against an enemy who enjoyed an un unbelievably numerical superiority. This time our armies were even without the horses we used to have the, the year before, before dragging heavy machinery through the snow, as most of them had died during the winter. We were also seriously short on fuel. Everywhere columns of vehicles in perfect conditions were burned to keep them from falling into enemy hands. While the infantry plodded slowly westward in tattered boots, the Russians were well aware of our disarray and worked overtime hoping to weaken the center army. All our available resources were placed at the disposition of certain units which were then reorganized from top to bottom and sent out to deal with desperate particular situations. This is what happened to our group, giving us the impression for a couple weeks that we once again controlled the step. Our principal difficulty, which was clear to us even then, was a question of supply. And as we reached the prearranged sectors too late. At dawn, when our Panzergruppe stopped, both men and machines were gray with dust. As planned, we had reached a vast forest which stretched right across the eastern horizon. We were allowed two hours to rest and put them to immediate use, as the jolting of the trucks had been exhausting. But we were awakened again before we'd really been able to sleep. The weather was perfect, with a soft, a cool breeze rustling the autumn leaves, and this perfection made everything seem easier. We jumped on board again, wreathed in smiles, Toward noon, the dispatch riders, who were already quite far ahead of us, rejoined the front on the column. Brief orders were issued, and shortly afterwards, a large part of our group turned off for a village, which was soon in sight. We could hear the sound of automatic weapons, and before we quite realized what was happening, about 15 Tiger tanks were firing at a small cluster of houses. That's page 227, the very bottom. Two, two, seven.